torahcafe.com. Does being a Jew mean belonging to a particular race? Raise your hand if you think Judaism is a race. A race. Well, good. Then we're all in agreement because there's no such a thing as a Jewish race. Race denotes a biological distinction, uh, common ancestry, and so on. And of course, there can be no such a thing as a Jewish race because there is a nation made up of Jews from every single race and color, black and white and whatnot. Descendants of every conceivable race have joined the Jewish people throughout the ages, being universally recognized as Jews. So race, it is not. Is the definition of a Jew being a matter of national identity? I suggest again, certainly not, because nationality can hardly be a definition for a people that have been dispersed throughout the world for more than 2,000 years. We've been without country, without homeland. For two-thirds of the years of our existence, the Jewish people lived amongst different nations. Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, etc., etc., etc. And of course, during all those years of dispersion, the Jewish people were joined by thousands of men and women, none of whose ancestry has ever been traced back to the ancient land of Israel. So to define Jews as a nationality is also historically untenable. So on balance, to be a Jew means to be a part of a faith, a religion, a people. And once you use the very definition of religion, then you invariably bring God into the equation. And of course, once you bring God into it, you have to also understand that there is no such a thing as an exclusive belief in God without also determining what it is that God wants from me. And once we talk about religion, to choose or to accept a religion means to accept for yourself a certain special way of life. Religion by its very definition means intellectual and emotional conviction, a, a profound conviction that the believer perceives as absolute truth regarding the ultimate values of life, of reality, etc. So religion, by its very definition, necessitates it to be theocratic, not democratic. By its very definition, it means that God and He alone initiates and defines religion and revelation. God and He alone says what is acceptable to Him and what is not. God and He alone can only state and define what conforms to His will. There has to be some mandate, something, that helps us define our role. And that's why Judaism, of course, is also based on the public revelation at Sinai, when the Torah was given to Israel. As Rav Sadia Goen said already more than a thousand years ago, Judaism is defined solely by Torah. Without Torah as divine revelation, there is no such a thing as Jewish values or Jewish morality. Indeed, without religion, there are no values, there are no morals altogether. Moreover, Judaism differs fundamentally from other faiths in that it is a very personal relationship between you and God, which is why the very first of the Ten Commandments is written very particularly in the singular form, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord your God. As a Jew, therefore, you know in your heart of hearts that God believes in you, and that he selected you to carry out a mission for him, for yourself and for all of mankind. That's the general definition of a Jew. But being a Jew means something so much more as well. You know, they tell of a man who was just waking up after surgery. He opened his eyes, he looked to his wife who was sitting by his bedside and he said, honey, you are beautiful. And then he fell back asleep and she's thinking, wow. 20 years, I haven't heard that in a long time. So she decides to sit there a little longer. About an hour later, he opens up his eyes again. He says, honey, you're cute. She says, what happened to beautiful? He said, the drugs are wearing off. <laughs> Being a Jew is not some spiritual or emotional high that can wear off. It's not some wave we ride, which then goes out with the tide of our lives when we so determine. Being a Jew, like we said in an earlier lecture today, like regarding faith, is innate, it's part of who you are, it's your spiritual DNA. Even those who don't want to believe that cannot help but acknowledge it. 
I do some television with the BBC in London. Um, and I, not long ago, met over there with somebody in broadcasting who told me how at the very beginning of his career, he used to pull up over there in the car park, and before he got out, he would always take his yarmulke off his head. And one day he met over there with a particular well-known anchorman called Trevor McDonald, today Sir Trevor McDonald. Black man, wonderful individual. This goes back about, I don't know, many years ago. And he told me how he met up with Trevor in, of all places, the men's room. And Trevor says to him, oh, you're that guy from upstairs. He goes, I gotta ask you a question. Why is it I often see you pulling up and I sometimes see you taking your cap off your head before you come into the building, why? He says, well, listen, you know, I'm Jewish, obviously, but I, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to look different. I don't want to be different than everybody else. And Trevor McDonald looks to him and says to him, you know, I am the only black person in this building apart from the cleaner. Again, this is going back many years ago. He says, how do you think that should make me feel? Whenever I walk into the boardroom, I am the only black man there, and I immediately sense my difference. And then he looked to this other guy, he pinched the black skin of his face and he added, you see this? It's who I am. It doesn't wash off. Those are powerful words. With the ever increasing threat of anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head yet again, with the growing uncertainty of what the future holds, with Israel living under a barrage of constant terror in the face of all of this, as Jewish people who grapple with their identity day in, day out, those powerful words have to resonate with us because we have to remember that it never washes off, that the greatest, most forceful response to the pending threats that lurk out there is to stand tall and proud in our identity and stick to our responsibilities. What is essentially our responsibility? Well, for that, again, we look back to what happened when we were first proclaimed as a Jewish nation, which again took place with the giving of the Torah at Sinai. When God spoke those Ten Commandments more than 3,000 years ago, there was, as we read about, this noise, this thunder, this terrible explosion, a theophany, if you like, that took place. Each of our ancestors was personally there taking in the spiritual impact of the event. In fact, not just our ancestors, but as our sages tell us, every single one of our own souls was present, absorbing the experience into our own psyche, integrating the divine event as an integral part of our Jewish essence. The question is this, think about this a moment. What was the all-defining characteristic in this mass revelation? Is it the fact that God spoke or is it the message that God gave us? It seems to me that it was the very revelation itself. Because, you know, if you separate one from the other, if you take one away from the other, what would be the more important aspect? Is it the fact that God spoke to us, but not necessarily knowing the content? Or having the message, but not necessarily knowing that it came from God? As a people, is it more important that we have some very interesting message, or is it the fact that God spoke to us as a people, which then gives credence to everything else which is taught in every dimension of our religion. The opening verse introducing the Ten Commandments states, and God spoke all these words to the Jewish people saying. What does that mean? It could have very succinctly said, and God said. God said, and then go on with the Ten Commandments. Why does it say, and God spoke all these words? What's with that extra wording? And our rabbis explain that it's there to demonstrate that unlike a human being who has to articulate every single word individually, God, the omnipotent being, spoke all of these words of the Ten Commandments at the same time, simultaneously. Now, insofar as we are mortal beings, confined to human limitations, if all the words are spoken at once, then surely we will not have been able to accept the message. We would not have been able or capable of hearing what was being said any more than if all of you were speaking all at once and me trying to hear what is being said. So what's the point in God speaking all of these words at one time? And the answer is clearly what is obvious is that it initially wasn't about hearing the fine detail. That's something that could happen later. 
In the first instance, it was about God doing what only God could do so that we would be able to embrace the enormity of the very real experience, God speaking to the people. That was enough in order to make the necessary impression on the masses. But that was only the first necessary step. After the Ten Commandments, the Torah relates the following. The entire people saw the sounds and the flames and the sound of the shofar, and the mountain was full of smoke and the people saw, and they trembled, and they began to move away. Every person there was aware that they had just encountered and experienced something miraculous. They had this colossal religious experience. Have you ever stopped to consider what would happen if God spoke to you? If you suddenly had this spiritual communication, would that be a good thing or would that be a bad thing? On the one hand, it sounds incredibly tantalizing. Wow, God is speaking to me. But wonderful as it may be, here's your problem. That means that God is speaking to you, and you then have to ask yourself, did that really just happen, or did I just have a psychotic episode and need to get help? The point is that the experience could be so overwhelming that it might even prove counterproductive. The Jewish people at Sinai experienced God, and what was their response? They back up, they move away, they turn to Moshe and they say to him, you speak to us, and then we'll be able to hear, don't let God speak to us again, otherwise we might die. And Moshe from his part pleads with them, no, don't be afraid, God wants to elevate you. Let the fear of God become internalized within you so that you won't come to sin. Nonetheless, the people move away and that opportunity is missed. In the first instance, God wanted the people to know this was real. It was more about the revelation than the content that the people experienced. Then he also wanted to invite them in to listen to the detail as well. And at that point, they backed off. They missed an opportunity. Moshe pleads with them, listen to the detail as well so that you won't come to sin. Not that that would have impeded their free choice, just that if they hear the detail, the content directly from God as well, then that would be integrated into their psyche such that it would become far less likely for them to sin. But the people are afraid, and the negative consequences ensue. And you might sum up that whole event in the following way. They took in the big picture, but they shied away from the detail. And what's fascinating about that is that nothing's changed. From all those years ago until present day, there are Jews, wonderful Jews, who love the big picture of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, but they get frustrated. One might say maybe even fearful when it comes to the details. You can walk into a room and you could be immediately struck by the beauty of a Picasso or a Rembrandt. But it is only the person who truly understands art, who appreciates art, who will scrutinize the picture in all of its intricate detail in order to reach into the mind of the artist, to connect to the artist and really appreciate what is happening, what the artist is looking to convey in his handiwork. Conversely, there are people who are punctilious in their observance in the details of the Torah, but alas, they miss the big picture. Doesn't our world today readily attest to what happens when people get stuck in the letter of the law, but they ignore the spirit of the law? You can have Jews who are scrupulous in their observance. They adhere to every fine detail, but at what expense? Looking down upon others, whom they deem to be lesser mortals than themselves, shunning those who don't agree with their standards, or, or maybe even worse. So the big picture of Judaism is the Jewish identity, the Jewish pride, the awareness of the fact that we are all interrelated, interdependent, responsible for one another, that ultimately we are carved from the same mold. The detail, of course, is what you might call the nitty gritty of Jewish observance, the purpose of the revelation at Sinai was for us to receive both the big picture and to appreciate how the details create the beautiful mosaic that is the big picture. And the message that we take on board from that all defining event is that we need not be afraid when God speaks, listen. If you're interested in the picture and you're lost in the detail, 
then go explore the detail. If you're stuck in the detail and you miss the big picture, open your eyes to it. Because Judaism can only prove itself meaningful in the blend of both elements, without which whether one is lacking or the other, then you go lacking. That's just all by way of introduction. So with that in mind, I think our world today in the 21st century is teetering on the brink. The problem essentially is twofold. We face two threats. There is the external and there is the internal. From an external perspective, there is a very real threat, yes, of anti-Semitism as it rears its ugly head again. I don't know the extent here in the United States, but I can tell you certainly from a European perspective, the sociologists debate the essence of the threat. Some insist that it's spiraling out of control, far-right nationalist parties rising to prominence. Not a week goes by without reading in the paper about one attack or another, and most of those stories, as commonplace as they are, are now kind of relegated to a few inches of column space, and that's in the Jewish press. Yes, credit has to be given to governments that have prioritized legislation against race hate crimes. It certainly makes people think twice before they choose to express any kind of racial sentiment, but really, what does legislation do apart from suppress something? It doesn't genuinely cure it. Racism, anti-Semitism, it's not some kind of virus like polio that can be eradicated by social and legislative medicine. And dare I say it, you don't have to go to the statistics for this. Anyone who looks into their own heart honestly knows this to be true. Prejudice is one of the principal constituents of the human personality. So the question is to the extent that society can genuinely control what can only be described as irrational hatred. It's not. Anti-Semitism is not dead by any stretch of the imagination. It's like a sleeping dog, again, just waiting for the opportunity to rear itself. There is a controversial flip side to this argument that for however much racism is tragically alive and well, isn't it sometimes agitated by so-called would-be victims? In other words, isn't it sometimes our own hypersensitivity that exacerbates a problem? Who exactly determines what is bigoted and what is acceptable norm? Who draws the line and where does it get drawn? Or to put the question more succinctly, is the hypersensitivity in itself maybe sometimes creating the problem? Whatever the argument, whatever the bottom line, the real consideration is what can you and I do about it? Some argue that we're better off just keeping a low profile, as has again become the acceptable norm, again certainly in many parts of Europe. Yes, even kippah-clad youngsters are strongly encouraged to exchange their yarmulkes, at least for baseball caps. I don't buy it. I maintain that when you revert to what the author Israel Zangwill once called the ghetto stoop, then walking with your head down, keeping below the radar, we're feeding into the stereotype. We nurture the germ. We're scoring an own goal. If the whole point and purpose of anti-Semitism is to kind of reduce the Jewish people into oblivion, then surely we are really only accommodating the process when we choose to lie low, as it were. To my mind, the forceful response, the only response, again, is to walk with your head held high in appreciation of who you are and what it is that you stand for. Because it's only when you don't respect yourself that others won't respect you either. And people mistakenly assume that when you take too much pride in your own identity, when you're too overtly Jewish or whatever else, that's counterproductive to a society that is looking to homogenize all group types into one broad mix. Kind of reminds me of, apparently a true story, a rabbi in Manchester in England who only had nine and needed that tenth man. He's standing outside, as you can imagine, in his talus and his tefillin, looking for that tenth man. And people are walking by, casting him this sort of curious glance and whatever, until one man stops and he looks at him. He says, Feh, standing outside like this, aren't you ashamed of yourself? It's a disgrace. It's disgusting. He looked, he said, ah, oh, you're just who I need. Come inside and be the tenth man. <laughs> There's nothing wrong to have pride in your own nationality and heritage. Englishmen, Germans, Americans, French, Jews, and whoever else, other faiths. 
Each one of them has a heritage. And there is a certain virtue to being subjective about your own heritage. In fact, I'm especially proud about my own ancestry of my people. Moreover, to be a pious and fervent follower of any religion, by definition, means that you have to believe that you are in possession of an absolute truth that has an advantage over all other religions. Otherwise, you have no reason to adhere to it altogether with your mind and soul. The only problem, the only problem is when it spills over and it gets to a point of excess where it is no longer about being proud of your ancestry, but it turns into a lack of respect for others. And I suggest to you that the big problem is that society as a whole doesn't know what Judaism really stands for. For some, it's about what they perceive it as world dominance. After all, we talk about Mashiach. We talk about universal salvation. We speak of universal laws. Historically, this was, only already, this was already interpreted as, in other words, we're looking to make the world ours. And therefore, in as much as it is part of the basic Jewish responsibility, yes, to teach the world about the Noahide laws, you won't find any mention of this in the Code of Jewish Law or any of the other responsa, if only because of the challenging times during which many of these works were authored and how much it would have been readily misconstrued with the consequences that could have likely ensued. For others, Judaism is seen, if not as supremacy, then certainly superiority, the chosen people complex. Who do we really think we are? And for others still, the sum total of Judaism is inextricably linked with Israel, which is why whatever happens there invariably spills over into the diaspora, and then they'll have you think that you cannot equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. The tragic irony is this. Judaism is really the only faith that insists that you have purpose as you are. It's the one faith that doesn't proselytize, that insists that you are as God created you and you can therefore find true meaning in that role regardless. Unlike any other faith that insists that the only way to heaven is but through them, Judaism says you hold the ticket to heaven in your hands by virtue of who you are. What do we mean when we talk about chosen nation? If we're to fulfill that time-hallowed purpose of being a light onto the nations, that means that our foremost objective, our challenge, our responsibility is revealing the unity of God within a modern-day fragmented society. Because Judaism was formed because we were given the most crucial charge that humanity has ever been given. That is to represent to the rest of humanity the central point of what makes a human being and how to achieve purpose in life. All of that is underpinned by a basic premise of belief in God, without which everything, like we said before, becomes purely subjective. And when you do that, you invariably create more of an understanding of what Judaism represents. That Judaism is built not on power, but on taking responsibility for the powerless. Built not on wealth, but on taking responsibility and caring for those who may be poor and lacking. Not on strength, but on responsibility and compassion for the weak. In fact, the moral lesson of all of Jewish history is that all the great empires seemed invincible in their time. Egypt, Babylon, ancient Greece, Rome, etc., all the way through Germany and the former Soviet Union. But they have all since disappeared and disappeared into dream stuff. The jury, which was so small and dispersed, always at risk, continues to survive. Because the only people who prove to be invulnerable are those who care and assume responsibility for the vulnerable. And we therefore, as part of our challenge, have a responsibility, a paramount responsibility, not to lose sight of that purpose and mission statement. There's nothing wrong, in fact, we have that great responsibility to go out there and to put that message out there. They tell of this uh, man, a traveling salesman, who made a very deliberate point of going into a local shul wherever he found himself, to daven there. His problem came about when he arrived in Shropshire, a tiny little town somewhere in the north of England. There was no shul for 100 square miles. So he did the next best thing. He went into the small town church, took a seat at the back, put on his talisman tefillin, and prayed away. 
It was a Sunday. People soon arrived for mass. After a while, the priest notices people shifting uncomfortably with the guy in the back, so he says, right, will all those who really feel that they don't belong please make your way to the exit? And the man is continuing to shuckle away, seemingly oblivious. So the priest <clears throat> clears his throat. He says, will all non-Christians please make your way out as mass is about to commence? The man pulls his telus even tighter over his head, and he's really going for it. And this incredulous priest finally bellows, all Jews leave now. And the man quietly takes off his telus, takes off his fillum, rolls them up, packs it all together, tucks it under his arm, walks to the front of the church, takes the statue of you-know-who under his other arm, and says, come on, Bubala, we're not wanted here. <laughs> Even as at times we are faced with a world that says you are not wanted here, we have to summon the courage and the strength in recognizing that true status is not determined by power and privilege, but by moral courage. As a Jew, your responsibility is to ride the rapids regardless, and yes, to take a message out there to Jew and non-Jew alike, that those whom the world despises for whatever reason, God loves and recognizing God's image in the weak, the powerless, the afflicted, the suffering, and fighting for their cause. It's very easy as a Jew over all these years to have a persecution complex, to feel so beaten up after all these years that you think that what you do doesn't really matter anymore. You can't make any difference. If you think that way, let me take you back in time to what was certainly one of the single most defining events in all of Jewish history, a well-known story that we're familiar with as Joseph is sitting there languishing in the home of his master Potiphar and the wife of Potiphar sets eyes upon him. And the Torah tells us how she spoke to him day after day, slowly she's chipping away at his resistance. And then it was on a certain day when this wife of Potiphar made her move and Joseph is now faced with an ultimate choice. Do I cave into temptation or do I stand strong in my resolve? That choice made all the difference to Jewish destiny. Think about it. Had he given in that one time, he would have continued living happily in his master's household. She would have forgotten about it. He would have forgotten about it. Life would have carried on as normal, and he wouldn't have amounted to a whole lot. Everything would have remained pretty much uneventful. But as we know, he resisted. In her humiliation, she libeled him. He wound up in jail where he deciphers the dreams, the butler and the, but the, butler and the baker, eventually taken out to decipher Pharaoh's dreams, becomes viceroy in Egypt. That results in his family coming down to Egypt, and that sets the tone for the next two centuries, the subsequent travels in the desert, and so forth. Such is the power of our choices. It all came down to a single moment of conscience. But something happened in that instant. Something so compelling. We're told that at that precise moment, Joseph saw an image of his father before his eyes. Well, what does that mean? On one level, it means that, plain and simply put, he looked at his father. He looked what his father had gone through. He looked to his past, his traditions, his roots. Had his father, Jacob, been best friends with the deceitful lover? Had his father, Jacob, been a partner with his evil twin, Esau? then Joseph too would have looked at all of that and run the risk of going down that same sort of road. Yes, the next generation always runs the risk of slipping down the slippery slope when they're raised with inconsistencies and live with compromising standards. But Joseph sees a very real and clear image of his father in his mind's eye. He sees how his father battled Esau, battled Lavan, and the angel and all the other embodiments of evil, and he prevails. Is he about to throw all of that past away just for a few moments of transient pleasure? And so in awareness of this, he refuses to yield. But then, Hasidism tells us something so compelling. He saw something so much more than that as well. There's a very curious passage in the Talmud that tells us that the image of Jacob was similar to the image of Adam, the first man. When Joseph sees the image of his own father, it wasn't just that which he saw. He saw the image of Adam. He saw Adam holding that fruit in his hands and thinking to himself, so what if I eat from this tree? 
He looks to his right and he looks to his left and he says, it doesn't matter, the world is mine and mine alone. What I do won't make any difference. And as we know, he ate from that fruit, he digested, well, maybe all of three minutes has passed, and those minutes have a lingering effect until present day. All the negativity that we have come to know in our world, all the pain, all the suffering, all the illness, indeed the very threat to man's mortality stems from that single act. And in that nanosecond, that's exactly what Joseph saw. He saw that Adam was created alone, singular, in order to appreciate that destiny is in your hands. You have powers and you have influence beyond your wildest dreams. What you do in your slice of the world reverberates and affects the whole of our universe in ways unimaginable. You know, I remember some years ago there was a picture in much of the European press, maybe here as well, of two Israeli soldiers standing over a dead terrorist body. They were posing. And there was tremendous criticism in the national press, an outcry in response by the Jewish world as to why the media felt the need to run this picture and the story when there was so much worse being done and perpetuated by others. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, the hard fact is that yes, Jewish people are held up to scrutiny. Yes, the land of Israel and the people of Israel are held by the world to a different standard. Is it hypocritical that on the one hand they hold us to a different standard while at the same time they challenge us as to why we hold ourselves to a higher standard? Yes, certainly so, but that doesn't alter reality. Daily we are faced with choices. Daily life challenges us with situations that come in so many shapes and forms. The way we relate to God, to our spouses, to our children, to our peers, to our neighbors, to our business acquaintances, and these tests reflect the genuineness of our commitment, the depth of our faith, and the measure of our character. We, like Joseph, have to recognize with every fiber of our being that beneath the layers, the image of God is permanently there, and that it is an integral part of our essence, of who we are, and that therefore, just as God is eternal, everything we do has eternal consequences. And just as God has passed present and future rolled into one, what we do has eternal value for the past, for the present, and for the future. Will that eradicate the external threat of anti-Semitism? You cannot use logic and explanation to hope to eliminate something that is founded in the first instance on gross irrationality. But I think it will go a long way to dispel the myth and make enough of a difference at least to those who care enough to listen. That's in regard to the external threat. What about in regard to the internal? You know, what is it they say, the difference between a Jew and an anti-Semite? You go over to the anti-Semite, so what do you think of Jews? Jews, huh, they're all a bunch of crooks. They think they're special, but they're all a bunch of nobodies. I hate them. Really, uh, what about Cohen? Uh, Cohen, actually, he's a nice guy. And Levy, Levy, he's a mensch. I like doing business with him. You go over to the Jew and you say to him, so what do you think about Jews? He says, my brothers, my sisters, I love them all. And what about Cohen? Oh, that son of a gun, such a schlamuzzle, I can't stand him. And Levy, oh, what a gun if I never want to see him around me. When we talk about being a good Jew, what does it mean? Many typically define being a good Jew as being able to, to rise above the parapet, to endure and survive against the odds. Isn't that, after all, what we've done through all these many years of Jewish history. But as Dennis Prager actually once put it, 3,300 years of Jewish continuity, and we have to live it ourselves so that we can persevere and preserve that little corner in the Guinness Book of Old Records as the longest surviving persecuted minority. Is that really what it's all about? So what does it mean to be a good Jew? To be kind, to be honest, to be polite? That makes for a mensch, that makes for a good person. But it doesn't make for a good Jew. You know, a good lawyer can be a great cook and a great baseball player and what have you, but that doesn't make for a good lawyer. It makes for a good lawyer somebody who has a thorough understanding of the law and the ability to win cases. A Jew is a person who's chosen by God for a specific mission. To make this world holy, good, godly. The Jew has a very specific divine instruction, like we said before, about how to carry about this mission. They're found in the Torah. 
and they've been explained by the Jewish sages throughout the ages. And therefore, to be a good Jew means somebody who's doing his or her utmost to follow those instructions and to fulfill God-given mission. Being good and being a good Jew means the belief in something so important that for 3,300 years, many lived and many others died for it. And by definition, determining, as in the very words of the Bible, Ma Hashem what is it that God really wants from me? Malcolm Mutteridge, who was the former editor of Punch Magazine, became religious in his latter years. And <clears throat> in an interview, he was once asked how he made the leap from satire and cynicism to religion. And he answered by quoting a friend of his who was a yachtsman. And it once told him, if you want to enjoy the freedom of the high seas, you have to first become a slave to the compass. The inexperienced person will say, why on earth do I need to follow such a meager gadget? I want to go where I please. It's my yacht. It's my sea. I want to do what I want. But any thinking individual knows that without that navigational tool, you're just going to wander in circles and maybe even get lost altogether. If you want to enjoy the freedom of the high seas, you have to first become a slave to the compass. There are so many assaults on the basic mores in our world today. The subjective social value system, like a pendulum that swings back and forth. What is illegal today becomes legal tomorrow. But legal and illegal do not necessarily determine what is right and what is wrong. Religion, on the other hand, has established values, absolute principles, and that's what determines right and wrong. Religion in general and Torah for the Jew is the compass of life. It shows us where to go and how to get there. And without such guidance, people wander aimlessly. They're frustrated. They're restless. In ever constant pursuit of that elusive meaning for life. Does that cramp our style? Does it stifle our ability to express ourselves? No more than you would think that the compass blinds and binds the captain. In fact, God begins all of the Torah again by addressing the slave mentality. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the houses of bondage. He didn't say who created heaven and earth. Because in so doing, he's reminding us that all of Torah, embracing a divinely dictated moral code, will extricate you from the entrapments of social mores and give you a true freedom of spirit, such that you will find real expression in life. But then there is another point to consider as well. Because Judaism is more than just about being a religion. Religion, the Hebrew for religion is dat, or das, which is actually a term that is foreign to biblical literature. The Jewish people are called an am, a nation. Yes, we're a nation that has a covenant with God. And the one reason why we are called an am, a nation, is because a religion by its very definition implies a people bound together by a common belief system. And let's face it, we are bound together in spite of our religious differences and disparity. Because at the core, we are a nation that has a covenant with God. And I want to share with you a distinct Talmudic story that illustrates this point. The Lubavitch Rebbe actually referred to this at a public gathering many years ago. But he referred to that story that is told about a certain woman, Miriam, the daughter of Bilga, who did something that resulted in the whole priestly dynasty of her family of Bilga being subsequently denied service in the temple. What does she do, says the Talmud? She hit the side of the altar with her sandal. And why did her whole family have to suffer consequences as a result, says the Talmud? Because woe to the wicked and woe to the neighbor. By definition, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. If she can do this, then that reflects on something bad overall in her family. And then the Talmud goes a step further and says, and likewise, good to the righteous and good to the neighbor. And the simple question that is asked then is this, why would the Talmud look to derive such an important principle, good to the righteous and good to the neighbor, from such a negative story? The woe to the wicked, woe to the neighbor, fair enough, I understand. But why the other part? Why such a positive lesson from such a negative story? Who was this woman? She lived in the time of the Greek invasion of the temple. She renounced her faith and she married a Greek officer. She turned on her religion and she turned on her people. And when the Greeks stormed the holy temple, she went in. She stepped forward towards the altar. She removed her sandal and she began to beat the side of the altar, crying out, Lucas, Lucas, wolf, wolf. You consume the Jewish people's wealth through the sacrifices that they bring. 
but you don't now answer them in their time of distress. Now, that's her big offense. That's why we say that her family has to suffer the consequences. Hitting the altar pales in significance to the intermarriage and the apostasy that she committed. She renounced her faith. She married a Greek. She collaborated with the enemy who looked to conquer the holy temple. She places a profane animal upon the holy altar, yet notwithstanding all of this, her dynasty is punished. Why? Because she struck the side of the altar with her sandal. And yet here, we learn a powerful lesson that is as simple as it is compelling. Do you know why God sometimes punishes us? Because in the words of the prophet, you alone have I known from all the nations of the earth, and therefore I will exact judgment for your sins. God holds a Jew accountable for his or her actions precisely because he loves them. When you're indifferent to somebody, then you couldn't care less about what they do, whether they do right or wrong. It's of no real concern to you whatsoever. It's of no relevance to you. But a parent is pained when a child commits any kind of offense. And it's precisely on account of tough love, of wanting the best for your child, that sometimes you have to look to reprimand the child in the hope that they will then mend their ways. The parent punishes the child not out of rage, but out of love. Not to hurt the child, but to make the child better. Only because God loves us does it bother him when we turn astray. Now you'd think that God has a cutoff point, that you can do things sufficiently wrong such that the seemingly more trivial acts don't matter anymore. But nobody ever gets written out of God's books, not in Judaism anyway. You know why? Because somewhere deep down, nobody ever really writes God out of their hearts. A Jewish girl who renounced her faith who married a non-Jew, you'd think God would renounce her, write her off and say, that's it. Other religions would certainly do so. Says the Talmud, it still matters to God how she will conduct herself even in the presence of the holy altar. Why? Because it matters still to her as to what is happening to her people. She married the Greek who conquered her people, who conquered Jerusalem, who conquered the holy temple and the altar therein. She accompanied him as his wife every step of the way, but when she sees her fellow Jew suffering, she cannot ignore the reality. She can ignore it, but only on an external superficial level. Her soul cannot ignore it and she cries out, wolf, wolf, why are you doing evil to your people? Why are you ignoring your people? And that then demonstrates the power of the indestructible Jewish spirit. No matter its outward appearance, regardless of what may seem to the naked eye, even in that lowliest spiritual abyss, even in the midst of the sin itself, that soul remains attached and inextricable from the source in God. And that's why it's not surprising that even in her tragic story, we still learn such an important moral principle from her. Because when you go out into the world and you encounter another Jew who looks and who acts anything but like a Jew, and when you ask them, they won't even deny it. They'll openly acknowledge their apostasy. And you'll be taken aback and you'll think to yourself, what kind of connection do I want to have with that other person? I need to distance myself. Woe to the wicked and woe to his neighbor, says the Talmud. You have to reach out. Why turn around and say, woe to the wicked and woe to the neighbor? Make him your neighbor, whereby it'll be good for the righteous, that is yourself, and good for the neighbor, that is him. Show them how to emulate you. Set the example, show the way, reach through their heart and touch their soul. A man who once came before the Lubavitcher Rebbe and explained, or the rabbi who introduced him explained that he was thinking of marrying out. And the Rebbe looked to him and said to him, I envy you. And the guy must be thinking to himself, you envy me, I mean, hey, the girl isn't all that. But the Rebbe went on to explain and said, precisely because God presented you with such a challenge means that God also obviously gave you the strengths with which to be able to overcome that challenge. And that I am not presented with that challenge means that clearly I don't have those strengths. And that man who later went on to marry someone else and build a wonderful Jewish home explained that that was a turning point in his life. Why? Because as he said, the first rabbi that my rabbi introduced me to spoke to me all about my Jewish past. 
all about the war years, giving Hitler a posthumous victory and all of that sort of thing. He says, I didn't relate to that. It's my past, not a part of me. The other rabbi whom I was brought to spoke to me all about my Jewish future, about that'll be the end of my Jewish line and so on and so forth. He goes, I'm not there yet. But this was one rabbi who was addressing me as a person in the here and now of my current life. And that really spoke to me. That's the challenge. God gave us two hands. One, yes, to hold tight to your past. The other, to reach out towards the future. That's what gives you balance, but you're standing in the here and now, and that's what really matters. So let me just wind up with the following. The challenge is, indeed, for us to get a little bit more passionate about Jewish life, about our role therein, about our Jewish identity, about our impact on the wider world as a whole. You find Judaism difficult, I say to you, it's not because things are difficult that you do not dare, it's because you don't dare that things seem difficult. You find that one spiritual undertaking threatening, I say to you, every shot that we don't take is a guaranteed miss. You find that reaching beyond your comfort zone sometimes a little too risky, I say to you, if you don't risk anything, you risk even more. Sometimes we find Jewish observance too laborious, if we aim for the heavens, we'll get at the very least the earth thrown in. You question whether there's any, really any point, I say to you, the universe will reward you for taking chances on its behalf. Believe in yourself, not just as an individual, but even more so, and every bit so as a Jew. So to finish with a final anecdote about these two young Jewish brothers who were real troublemakers, and they were kicked out of every possible Jewish school, and the parents had no choice but to enroll them into a very staunch Christian reformatory school, which had a reputation for zero tolerance. And the younger boy is waiting at the back where the older son, older brother is sitting there in the office and the principal, a big burly priest, is sitting behind his desk and he says to him, young man, where is God? And the boy looks and shifts uneasily and says nothing. He says, young man, I asked you a question, where is God? And still the boy remains perfectly silent, at which point the priest comes menacingly from around the side of his desk and he's towering over this young child and he says to him, young man, I'm going to ask you one more time, where is God? At which point the boy jumped out of his seat, runs down the hall, runs bang smack into his younger brother who says, what? What is it? He goes, we got to get out of here, man. They lost God and they're blaming us. <laughs> We're living in a generation where some argue that we seem to have lost God. The historian Jacob Talman called the Jews a community of fate. The philosopher Martin Buber called us a people with a memory. And the suggestion is in this 21st century, the memory is fading. The community outside Israel is withering. The barriers are coming down and Jews are scrambling over. Taboos against mixed marriages are wilting. Jewish people are breeding less and less and being condemned less and less as outsiders. The demographic debate is no longer between the optimists and the pessimists, but between the, poor, the more pessimistic and the less pessimistic. Let's not waste time determining the faults. Who lost God? Where was God lost? Is God lost? Focusing on the negative, that's all destructive energy. It's damaging. It's a futile exercise. Our purpose, our mission, is about confronting the challenges, recognizing our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis our fellow Jews, and indeed the wider world, and then moving forward and getting on with the business of building brick by brick, soul by soul, for a better, more peaceful, more illuminating tomorrow.